I don't think the meaning of life is, is in happiness, it's in growth. And, and, and primarily growth in love and growth in wisdom. And so that, that's, that's my, my approach. And of course, all experiences can enable you um, to, to grow in that way. Hello, passionate listeners and watchers. Welcome to Passion Harvest. Thank you so much for joining me wherever you are in the world right now. I am Louisa, your host, and our guest today is David Lorimer. I'm so excited to have him on the show. David Lorimer embarked on a quest for wisdom and deeper understanding of life. David, originally a merchant banker, then a teacher of philosophy, is a writer, lecturer, poet, and editor. He's a founder of Character Education Scotland, program director of Scientific and Medical Network, former president of the Swedenborg Society, instigator of Beyond the Brain, a founding member of the International Futures Forum, has co-coordinated the Mystics and Science Conferences. He's the originator of the Inspiring Purpose Values Poster Program and chair of the Galileo Commission. David is the author and editor of over a dozen books, including Survival, Death as Transition, Resonant Mind, The Spirits of Science, Thinking Beyond the Brain, The Protein Crunch, and A New Renaissance. His most rec recent book is A Quest for Wisdom. In 2020, David was awarded a Lifetime Achievement Award as a visionary leader by the Visionaries International Network. This is his story and this is his passion. David Lorimer, welcome to Passion Harvest. I can't wait to hear your story and I'm so excited to have you on the show today. Welcome. Thank you. Um, my gosh, we do have, a, I've given you a lot of things I'd like to talk about. You're such an incredible wealth of information and you have done so much, but I'd like to start with your after you left the banking world, your quest for wisdom, deeper understanding of the meaning of life. Do you mind sharing pieces of that with the audience? Yes. Well, I, 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 I come from a sort of conventional upper middle class background. <clears throat> so I went to Eton, which is a very well known school. I mean, the prime minister, last two prime ministers and so on. Um, and what, what that gave me was a sense of independence, um, that uh, there are a lot of independent thinkers that come out of Eton. And then I was at St. Andrews University, and conventionally you go into the city, if you're someone from my background, many people do, and that's in order to make money, <clears throat> which enables you to send your children to private boarding schools, which you otherwise wouldn't be able to do. And and then you retire after you've made a lot of money, and that's it. Uh, well, of course, it isn't it at all. And um, this is not at all what life's about. And so after I left university, I did go into the city. I went into Morgan Grenfell, which is a city merchant bank. I spent two years there, uh, not doing a great deal, um, but realizing I had to get out of it sooner rather than <laughs> later. Um, but it was a valuable experience. And, and I had, as a student, I had um, worked at uh, Moite Chandon, the uh, Champagne House, and I asked, I sent a letter asking whether we might have a, a vacancy for me to come and back and, and guide people around the cellars in September and October 1976. And, and a letter came back and said, as it happens, someone sent a letter saying they couldn't do it, so you're absolutely welcome. And that was my cue to resign. And, and so I resigned the next day, uh, but I'd already arranged that I was going to go to Cambridge in 77, 78 to do the education course. And, and I, I, this was my, as it were, sort of sabbatical year. Actually, it's a, what I suppose Goethe would call it a Bildungsjahr. In other words, it was really formation, as French say formation, so formation, so formation. And what I did is I took um, four boxes of books um, and I read all of those books um, over the next few months, <clears throat> and also a lot of tapes, all my favorite music. I had to have my music um, with me as, as well. And that, that, that really laid the foundation of my quest ever since, because I had 
already come across Swedenborg, um, 18th century mystic and scientist. Um, but I took with me um, the, some great books on, the, on culture, um, Arnold Toynbee's study of history, a sort of thousand page abridgment, J.G. Fraser's Golden Bough, um, uh, Spengler, Decline of the West, um, Jung, um, Radha Krishnan, um, T.S. Eliot. Uh, there were a whole lot of other mystics. <clears throat> so I, I, th there was a lot of material in, in these four boxes of books. And so I would take people around the champagne cellars in, <clears throat> in, the, in the morning. And then between uh, tours, I would then read books. And so I got through an enormous amount. I love and, that. And what I was trying to do was sort of get an overview um, at, a same, at the same time as getting a sense of depth. Um, and so it was, a, it was an intellectual quest, um, but it was also a spiritual quest at a deeper level. Did you find what you were looking for from the books? And that's a good question. I think what you understand from books is not the essential. Um, the essential is, is what, what you understand intuitively within yourself. Um, but books can help place it in context. And so, you know, we are within a tradition um, in, in the West. And they're going back to um, you know, the pre-Socratic philosophers, you know, the Hebrews, um, the Egyptians, and, and the whole development of thought and the structuring of thought and that has happened you know, throughout our culture. And so you, if you want to know where you are historically, and then you need to understand the history and the trends and the pressures of the time you're living in. And so I think that's, that, that's the value um, of the reading. Um, but it's also in terms of, of recognition of inner experience. And so last night I was reading a book on mystical experience by a friend of mine called John Davidson, who's been meditating for 50 years. Um, and you recognize in the descriptions of stillness of mind, for instance, and quieting the senses and focusing the concentration, you, you recognize that as, as being part of universal spiritual practice uh, about which, you know, some of these great writers um, they talk and, and in terms also, obviously, of their own experience. I mean, most people search for happiness. Uh, was it a quest for you for happiness? Were you, so you were unhappy in, in the traditional roles? Were you searching for happiness on some level? trying to no. understand you no okay and, and, and I, I remember reading a piece <laughs> by Goethe when, when he said that, you know, that people at least his experience was he'd been perfectly happy for about four weeks of his life and he was writing this in his 80s and and so the the I don't think the meaning of life is is in happiness it's in growth and 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 primarily growth in love and growth in wisdom and so that that's that's my my approach, and of course, all experiences can enable you um, to to grow in that way. Absolutely agree. And since you've read all these incredible books, and I haven't, so for the audience, what's your take on the meaning of life? I know that's a very big question, but what, you know, and and your years of research and experience, what's your what's well, your the um, another there are all sorts of different ways one could um, answer that. But let, let me answer it um, from a, a very influential book that I read at an early stage called Man's Search for Meaning um, by Viktor Frankl. Amazing book. <clears throat> and it's a very famous book. It sold nine million copies in multiple languages. And it's about his experience in Auschwitz um, and how he survived it through an image of love and the realization that meaning could be found in suffering and um, not just in fulfillment um, or in, even in service. And, and so whatever situation you find yourself in, um, there is still meaning to be gleaned from it. Um, and that meaning it, it contributes to the development of our being. And I think that's really what we're trying to do here is we're trying to grow, grow our being um, while understanding that this being um, is in a sense universal. There's only one mind, there's only one consciousness. And, and so we're all 
fractals or microcosms um, of, of this one expression of mind, trying to discover and understand and express him slash herself. Well, that probably segues me onto your book, The Transition or Death as a Transition. And I know you've done an incredible amount of research on this. What is your thoughts of does consciousness survive the physical body when it dies? Well, the, that book I, I published in 1984, and I wrote most of it over the summer holidays um, from Winchester College, where I was teaching uh, in 1982. Um, and the, the question I was asking myself was, um, what happens exactly at death? And, and there, are two, there are two main possibilities. Um, one, which is the mainstream scientific view, that the brain produces consciousness, and therefore, when there's no brain, there can't be any consciousness. And the, the second is that death is, in some sense, a transition to another state, and, and that the brain may filter and permit certain types of consciousness, like a kind of tuning mechanism, um, but it doesn't originate consciousness. Uh, and so um, the essential part of ourselves is capable of surviving bodily death. Now, you'll, you'll know from your own experience, and anybody who's listening to us, um, that your view on this changes um, you know, as you get older. And so I wrote this book when I was 30. And, and when you're 30, you have a very strong sense of want to individuate yourself, of being different, of making a mark, um, all of that um, sort of first half of life, as Jung would say, your ego um, expression. Uh, and so the, there's a sense in which you, 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 you'd like the ego to survive. And I'm not sure that's how it is, in fact, because I think the ego is like a persona, which is a role that we play. And we're very conditioned by all sorts of circumstances in our families and attitudes and outlook and temperament and, and so on. So I'm not, I'm not, I think that's all um, on the surface. Um, but what I think we're doing is to try and plumb down into this deeper layer of identity which is which is a shared identity in which I, I would call the spirit because I think the spirit is universal and the soul is a is, a, is an, a, an individualization or an expression of, of spirit with a capital S which is the universal divine mind or consciousness and so that that universal divine mind or consciousness that 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 is intrinsically immortal um, there, there it cannot die um, because it is it is itself that consciousness is and 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 so in terms of what goes on um you know that there's that the evidence is that is that the the personality and memories um certainly do um continue and but i think we probably find that we are more multiple in terms of our being and what, what Thich, Nhat, Thich Nhat Hanh called interbeing, um, than, than we realize when we're in the body. And, and so, so I think we'll, we'll learn a lot um, in that, which we can't know and understand while we're still in physical form. And then there's the whole other question is, is it happening consecutively? Is it happening now? But that's probably a whole nother conversation. Yes, the whole, <clears throat> the whole nature of time. And I, I think, I think that um, the answer is probably a both and, um, because, because we can sort of change our past by reinterpreting it. Um, and clearly, you know, we are in a current timeline, um, which is our immediate reality. And, and so it doesn't make a lot of sense to me that I can be also living a 14th century life um, as in some completely different dimension. Um, but it would make sense that how I'm living now might have some resonant resolution or resolving um, possibility on, on a previous personality or indeed on another aspect or expression of a group soul. Um, because some people talk about group souls. They say um, that we are all part of a group soul. And the experience of the group is something that we can draw on immediately, even though it's not our own immediate experience. Mm -hmm. 
So we're almost learning and healing and growing as collectively. Totally, totally. And, and we, we have, we've set up the conditions for this in a major way, uh, especially over the last two years and the, this, this learning and growing. And I do think um, I, my friend, Natalie Zaituni, whose book Insolment um, came out or new one came out recently. Um, she says, we live in a, we live in a learning universe. You know, so we, the, the, the creativity and our lives, it's a constant learning and feedback process. And if we don't get, get things, you know, on the first round, then you'll have to come round again. Come back and, for another life. <clears throat> well, or even another incident, another incident of the same pattern. Or like yeah, cyclic exactly. patterns, which many of us experience with, in whatever form they come in relationships or all sorts of sorts of ways. Yes, uh, indeed. Yeah. Absolutely. You're meeting yourself. <laughs> um, you spoke about the ego and Viktor Frankl, and I just wanted to speak to you a little bit about fear, which holds so many people back from following their passions or their purpose um, or their mission in life. Do you mind just talking a little bit about fear? Because it's such a, it's just such a powerful blocking force to become our true yes, selves. Yes, no, completely. Well, um, let me let me contextualize this as a starting point with this uh, organization that I'm a part of called the International Futures Forum. And uh, we are sitting in at Schumacher College in I'm it's not me, it's Brian Goodwin, um, the biologist with his pupils at Schumacher College on the 12th of September 2001. And they're reflecting on the events of the previous day and wondering how how to react or you know, react the wrong way, respond positively uh, in order to come out of this vicious circle of violence and reprisal, and which the sociologist Peter M. Sorokin um, talks about. He says, hate begets hate, violence begets violence, love begets love. And so what they came up with was this idea of a fear loop um, and a love loop. And so in, when you're in the fear loop, you're trapped in this circuit, um, you can't get out of it. And, and this is associated with control um, and, and disempowerment. And then when you're in the love loop, um, then everything opens up. And so I regard certainly emotionally and spiritually, um, these are two poles uh, and our current system, uh, and particularly over the last two years um, has majored on fear. And, and this has been a deliberate policy of governments um, you know, if you take the UK as an example, the nudge unit, um, <clears throat> which is basically um, propaganda, uh, has been uh, deliberately manipulating people using fear um, to maximize compliance in, in to government policy. And, and fear is used uh, by the dark forces, and um, I think, again, as a means of control, because the the, the, the diabolical, in a sense, I think Steiner also said this, you know, tries to control, tries to impose, tries to make everything uniform, whereas the divine is associated with love and freedom, uh, and freedom not as self-indulgence, but freedom as the, as the expression, the full expression of being um, that we are. And so in order to move beyond where we are at the moment, um, it's my view that we need to develop a very deep philosophy and ethic of the power of love, not the love of power, which is what drives the current system, but the power of love. And we all know, actually, that this act, love is, in fact, the most powerful force in the universe. And we know we can know that from our own experience. And how do you, how do you forgive someone through love? How does forgiveness work? Well, it gets you out of this vicious circle of an eye for an eye, a tooth for a tooth, the, 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 the law of Moses, if you like, as opposed to the law of Christ. I, so it's hugely important. I agree with you. I'm just yes. thinking about so many, yes, re, I, I think about people and people are so afraid. Um, and you spoke about that loop of fear. Um, do you think we can get out of it. 
Well, I think what it requires, and this is the difficult part, um, is moral courage. And <clears throat> that if you're not prepared to stand up and stand out um, for what you believe in, um, then, then I think the future is quite, quite, bl quite bleak, quite dark. And, and so I, I think one person who inspires me um, is, is Bobby Kennedy, uh, Rob yes, Kennedy he's Jr. Amazing. And, and, then, and he has his, the, 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 he has the, the Kennedy rhetoric, uh, you know, if you listen to his father or you listen to JFK, um, but it comes from this really deep sense of value and dignity of the human. And, and why did the founding fathers put the constitution in place exactly for, to, to defend against the overreach of government and and the, the, these 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 um, the founding fathers were all Freemasons, which you might or might not know. But in a in a very positive sense, they believed in the freedom of thought and expression, in freedom of religion, and freedom of gathering. And all of this, um, as you know, has been uh, put on ice, and and we're we're told that it's, it's no lot this is no longer relevant. And we just have to do what we're told. And so, you know, revolutions and leadership um, is about moral courage and integrity. And, and things don't change unless people demand change. Let me, let me give you the, the main Peter Dunoff formula. May we have a heart as pure as a crystal, a mind as bright as the sun, a soul as vast as the universe, and a spirit as powerful as God and one with God. And it's this last phrase, a spirit as powerful as God and one with God. That's where we need to come from and, and in order to stand up and stand out. Uh, and there may be a cost to this. You're not necessarily going to be popular. Um, but the reason I came out of banking um, was I was trying to be true to myself and my deeper values. Um, and that had implications vis-a-vis you know, -vis, um, the view taken by that taken of this by my family they, they weren't at all pleased and so you, you there's always a cost to being true to yourself but but if you're not true to yourself then the the moral cost the spiritual cost is far more far greater you're almost living a half-life yeah you're not doing what you came here to do which is to be the fullest expression of yourself in service. And that requires overcoming fears. Fears are not real, they're irrational, but I, I mean, we all have them. You know what fear is, so do I, but it, taking those steps to overcome fears offers us great riches in different ways. Yes, and all the great people, I mean, Martin Luther King and Gandhi, they weren't people without fear. They're people who, faced up to their fear and they moved beyond it. And they had to do that repeatedly. It's not just a question of overcoming it one day and then you, you've cracked it. And you'll be, you'll be faced by situations which bring up fear, uh, you know, on a very regular basis. Yes, and life really does change when you can, in whatever capacity that might be, but when you can overcome your fears and be true to yourself, as, as, as you said, and follow what really intuitively feels right for you in your heart and based on love, it's really what it's all about. Yes, I think, I mean, the, 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 the Peter Dunoff principles, I think, are my bedrock, um, and they are love, wisdom, truth, justice, and goodness. And, and if you if you if you if you embody those, um, you you won't go far wrong. Well, I don't even need to ask you the question. How can you live your best life? You've just answered it. So thank you for that. Well, it's just I mean it's amazing. I mean you, I know you do so many things, and the work you do is incredible for this world. And I just want to thank you so much. Are there is there anything else you'd also like to share with the Passion Harvest audience that I haven't asked you, David? Yes, well, I I'd like to say a little bit more about Peter Dunoff, um, uh, Ben Seduno. <clears throat> um, he's, a, he's a Bulgarian sage who lived from 1864 to 1944. And I discovered him in, in 1985. 
and the, 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 one of the reasons that he's so important to me is that um, Jung wrote in, in a short essay on yoga in the West that people in the West should really psychically and psychologically and spiritually seek for something which is which comes out of the Western tradition. And so that's what I found. <clears throat> so uh, <clears throat> his teaching reaches back to the Cathars in, in the medieval period, of which are the Bogomils um, in France. And it again goes back to obviously to Christianity, um, and also, but also to Orphism and Pythagoras and the ancient Greek philosophers. And so, and in addition to that, um, he had, uh, the body was included in the dance and the movements. Every, I do movements with formulas every morning. I did them by the river this morning. And, and, and this is expressed in the panurythmy, which literally means um, uh, har it's um, harmony of movement, universal harmony of movement, panurythmy, which he, for which he wrote the music. And he, and he, he, he also uh, did all the choreography. Uh, and so these are symbolic movements which put you in touch with nature, they put you in touch with the, with the divine world, and they put you in touch horizontally with each other, with the other dancers, in, in, in the principle of harmony. And, and I've been many times to the Rila Mountains, where they have a community camp during the month of August. And you get up for sunrise, you watch the sunrise, you sing some songs, you say some prayers, and then at 10 o'clock, you all, you all go up the mountain to dance the panurythmy in a circle. And, and so this is symbolic also of a renewed eco-spiritual relationship with nature. <clears throat> so the materialist paradigm regards nature as dead and to be exploited for maximum human use. And, and this is what is at the root of our um, environmental ecological crisis at the moment, is that we're just taking too much and not giving enough back. And there's no equilibrium between the human and nature. We think we can just dominate and control nature when we're part of nature, which is where we need to, to get back to. And, and then, as I said before, um, the, the principles and um, the very simple principles of love, wisdom, truth, justice, and goodness um, are a bedrock for, for virtue and spiritual um, development and also for the emergence of a culture of love and a culture of wisdom. And all of this is explored in my book, Profit for Our Times, um, with the, the, the second edition introduction by the late Wayne Dyer. Where's the best place for people to connect with you? And I will put a link in the show notes as well. But, uh... Yes, well, probably partly through the, uh, the Scientific Medical Network website, which is scientificandmedical.net. Uh, I do have my own website, which is a little bit out of date, davidlorimer.co.uk, but also my work with young people that I've been doing, which um, is sort of suspended at the moment, called Inspiring Purpose. Um, I'm trying to enable young people to realize that they can happen to the world and not just the world happening to them. So that's inspiringpurpose.org.uk. And it's a program for 11 to 16 year olds, and it can be done online. And, and it's trying to, to generate and enable young people to tune into who they are, to their, to their deeper purpose, and they can really contribute something to life. Fantastic. I mean, of course, purpose is just such, it, without purpose is nothing really. Um, David Lorimer, thank you so much for being on Passion Harvest. It's just been such, a, we've covered a lot. It's been a really insightful interview, and I want to thank you for all the amazing work you're doing. Thank you so much. It's been, okay. been lovely to be with you. <laughs> Bye, David. Bye. If you liked this episode, please do subscribe for weekly passionate inspirational interviews.